Good evening, everyone, and welcome to UCLA. Thank you. <laughs> um, my name is Jean-Luc Margot, and I'm the chair of the Department of Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences. And I'm thrilled that so many of you are here today for our exciting event. Uh, I will be introducing the speaker for tonight's public talk. And I want to remind you that there will be a question and answer period after the talk. So if you have questions for our speaker, please write them down on an index card and our student volunteers will collect them at the beginning of the Q&A. So we're very excited about this evening's event because it is well aligned with our education and public outreach goals. Uh, I know that there are elementary and middle school kids in the audience and I know that there are also undergraduate and graduate students in the audience. And my hope is that the younger students will talk to uh, the older students later this evening and figure out what it's like to study Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences at UCLA. We're also very excited to host a public talk about planets around other stars because our mission is to understand and protect our home in the universe. Um, so um, we seek to understand how planets like ours form and evolve, how life arose on Earth, and whether other worlds are habitable. And in order to fully understand how the planets form and evolve, uh, it's really important to compare and contra contrast our planet to uh, other planets out there. So scientists in our department study all aspects of the Earth and other planetary bodies. And we're uh, thrilled about this talk where we, learn, we get to learn about other planets. As we will hear this evening, there are hundreds of billions of planets in this galaxy alone. Uh, there are probably tens of billions of planets uh, similar to Earth's size. Um, and so we want to use these data uh, to further our understanding of how planetary systems form and evolve and to figure out how the solar system ended up with this gorgeous, gorgeous planet that can support life. Um, so. Um, before I introduce the, the speaker, I would like to tell you about our next event. Uh, on Tuesday, May 9th, uh, we will uh, host an event about rocks that fall from the sky, meteorites. Uh, UCLA has one of the largest collection of meteorites in the country, and we will have a conversation with the chief curator of the UCLA meteorite collection, Professor John Wasson. He will tell us an intriguing story about the fall and recovery of a meteorite, a famous meteorite that happened over 100 years ago. It's a fascinating story. And after, which, uh, after that, we will open the floor to questions and have a conversation uh, with Professor Wasson. You will also have an opportunity to hold meteorites in your hand. So it should be a, a lot of fun, a fun event, and I hope to see you there. We will announce this on our email list, and we will also post it on the website. So this evening's event is made possible by the generosity of Michael Thatcher and Rhonda Rundle. And may I please ask Michael and Rhonda to stand and be recognized? So Michael and Rhonda have enabled uh, several initiatives in our department, uh, including the purchase of telescopes for education and public outreach. Uh, that we will use this summer on August 21st for the Great American Eclipse. Uh, they've also enabled the purchase of telescope time for a course on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, in which students use some of the largest telescopes on the planet, collect terabytes of data, and look for evidence of other civilizations. Uh, so thank you, Michael and Rhonda, for your generous support, which improves the quality of our programs and the student experience at UCLA. Michael is passionate about astronomy and planetary sciences. For the past 14 years, he has been uh, a guide at the historic Mount Wilson Observatory just north of Pasadena, and I can attest that he gives a wonderful tour. So if you have a chance, go and, go and visit uh, Mount Wilson. So he will be joining me later on stage uh, for a conversation with our speaker. We live at a truly special moment in the history of humankind. Uh, for thousands of years, people have wondered whether we are alone in the universe. And for hundreds of years, people have speculated about the number of planets out there and whether some of these planets might be habitable. 
But we did not know the answers to these questions until just a few years ago. For the first time in history, we know the answers to these questions. And we know the answers because of the Kepler mission and because of Dr. William Baruchi and his team. So just like Galileo completely rev revolutionized our view of the cosmos by demonstrating that Earth was not the center of the universe, Dr. Baruchi and his team have completely transformed our view of the universe by revealing the abundance of planets and the abundance of planets that are similar in size to Earth, which has enormous consequences for the prospects for life elsewhere. He is the most prolific planet discoverer of all time. For all his accomplishments, he has been honored with many national and international awards. We're extremely pleased that he was able to join us at UCLA today to tell us about the Kepler mission and its fascinating results. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Bill Baruki. Okay. Thank you very much, John. Thank you so much. Good evening. I have the uh, honor here of yeah, telling you a little bit about the Kepler mission and some of its results. Okay. Uh, the Kepler mission is a NASA space mission, a discovery mission, something that you send out first to find out what's out there. You will follow with other more uh, directed missions. So Kepler was designed to find out whether Earth-sized planets around stars like the Sun were common or rare. If they're common, then there may be a lot of life throughout our galaxy. If on the other hand, we don't find any, we design the mission to find a lot, we find nothing. The implication is that there isn't any other life out there. There's no place for it. We're alone. Think how bad that would be in that there would never be a Star Trek, <laughs> right? No place to go to. Let's see if we can get this to move. Okay, uh, I'm gonna have to look at that. I, I don't have a screen up here. So what I'm going to talk about is the, the results of the Kepler mission. I'm going to talk about the fact that we use those results how many stars have planets? What kind of planets do they have? What kind of stars have planets? To design these missions that will look, will look much deeper than Kepler looked, because it was a rather simple, inexpensive uh, discovery mission. So we're going to use that data to build missions that will fly and tell us, do the planets we find have atmospheres? Do they have water? Could they have biosignatures bio that indicate the possibility of life? So that's really one of the main goals of, of the mission. Not just these characteristics, but using the characteristics for future missions. And I'll talk a little bit about future missions uh, toward the end. When you think about finding planets, I think we all imagine that we'll build a big telescope, and we'll look at these stars, and we'll see if we see the little planets around it. That doesn't work. It doesn't work because the star is so much brighter. It's like 10 billion times brighter than the little light that's reflected from a tiny planet compared to this star. And so it's, the telescopes are overwhelmed with the light. We cannot see the planets. There are very few exceptions, and they, they really don't pertain to what we're talking about tonight. So instead, what we do is we look at the star and say, how is the starlight changed by the presence of a planet? One of the ways to do that of course, is to say, well, what if a planet moves in front of the star? It's going to block some light. The amount of light it blocks is the area of the planet to the area of the star. Astronomers are pretty good at determining the characteristics of the star, the size, the temperature, and so on. So we've got to find the size of our planet. Is it Earth-sized, or is it a giant planet, or is it a little tiny planet like Mercury? We also need uh, to find out how far, away from its, how far it is away from a star called a semi-major axis. And so we're going to look at the fact that this planet, as it goes around the star, blocks the light in a repetitive fashion. Every time it goes around once, that's one of its years. Earth has a, a year of 365 days. These have years from hours to days to months 
for many, many years. And so we're going to use that measurement of the period. We're going to use Kepler's third law, which tells us now, with that period and the mass of the star, how far the planet is from the star. We'll use the temperature of the star, the size of the star, and that'll give us the heat that this planet will, will receive. And if that heat is similar to that are received by the Earth, we're going to say it's an habitable zone. Liquid water could exist on its surface. So we're going to be particularly interested in planets in the habitable zone. Before we could accomplish this project, before we could build this mission, we had to prove that it would work. NASA doesn't want to spend millions of dollars on a mission that cannot or will not work. So basically, the research for this was started in 1983. The mission proposal started in 1992. And we proposed in 92, 94, 96, 98, and 2000 before it was finally accepted. In each case, we had to show that there was evidence that whatever we were proposing would meet anybody's objections. There's a review panel that looks at each of these proposals and said, well, we object because X or Y or Z. And so we take that information from the people who've had the, the willingness to, to, to examine these complicated proposals and tell us how to make it better. So one of the first things you ask yourself is, well, we know the sun's variable has sunspots. Can you see a little tiny planet crossing this, this star uh, when in fact the star is, is variable. And if you look at, this is a picture of our sun. This is a solar storm, it's called a solar maximum ejection event, SME. It's got, it hurls millions of tons of material out. There's the Earth in comparison. That's the correct size comparison. And we're supposed to watch this thing crawl across the surface? So there was some doubt at the beginning that this could be done. Well, what you do is everything you can imagine to bring the noise down, to bring the signal up. And one of the things that you can do is put a ultraviolet filter over the star, that is, over your telescope to block the ultraviolet light out. And this is what our sun looks like without the ultraviolet light. And so what you see is here's the size of the Earth, and here is a you know, much, much more uniform disk. But you still see spots here. These are sunspots. Sunspots are off on the size of the Earth. So how can you tell a little planet from a sunspot? Well, the answer is the sunspots are fastened to the star. So they rotate with the star, and the rot rotation rate of a star like the sun is something like 27 days. But it does vary somewhat from pole to equator. On the other hand, when a planet zips by, it's in orbit, it's traveling thousands of miles an hour, and so it zips by in a few hours. So you're going to look for something that may be small, but it goes by very fast and it repeats. Every orbital period is the same. It's the same to a part in 10,000, sometimes better than 100,000, although sometimes there are plants that will vary and we'll talk about those a little bit as well. So we're going to use that information. We're also going to use the information that the sun is about half the age of the Milky Way. Now that means that a lot of stars like our sun are older than our sun. Now, as a star gets old, it has fewer spots. It has less magnetic field. It rotates slower. It reminds me very much of, of a, a teenager, right? They have less spots as they get older. They uh, don't dance around quite so much. They sort of settle down. And that's true with stars, too. They have real lifetimes and real evolutions. And so we're going to count, or we did count, on the fact that most of the stars, or half the stars at least, would be quieter than the sun, or at least as quiet as the sun. But we had no evidence for that because no star had ever been looked at with the precision we could measure our sun. We can measure our sun to something like 10 parts per million. And that's what you need because when the Earth goes across the sun, that signal is about 80 parts per million. And you need a big ratio of the signal to the noise to say, yes, it really is uh, what we think it is, an orbiting object and not a spot or some other weird phenomenon. One of the things we had to prove was that we could build a photometer, we could look at thousands of stars simultaneously, because clearly this method is not going to work. If that planet isn't in your line of sight, it has to go in front of the star. If it goes around the star this way, you will never see a transit. So what's the odds that if you're looking at a particular star and it has a planet, that you'll see the, the planet cross the star? 
Well, the orbits are all randomly distributed. So the odds are still purely statistical. The chance you'll see it, if it exists, is proportional to the bigness of the star and the diameter of the orbit. So for planets that go around in short, very, very short periods, that's of the order of 10%. You're going to miss 90% of the planets that are there. But we're not interested so much in these short period planets. We're interested in planets like the Earth. It goes around in 365 days. What's the odds of getting that alignment right? The answer is about half of 1%. So clearly, if you say, I'm going to look at 10 planets or 10 stars, you're not going to see anything, even if they all have planets. So we don't do that. We look at 100,000 stars simultaneously. 100,000 times half a percent, 500 or so planets we should see. And that's just one orbit. So we should expect to see thousands of planets if they're common. But to do that, we have to look at 1,000 stars or 100,000 stars simultaneously. And we can't reduce the data by hand. It's too many, too much. So our proposal was that we would go ahead and show that, that that could be done. It wouldn't be done in the classical fashion where an astronomer goes out at night, he looks at that star, he measures how bright it is, and he measures it again to see if it's varying. Because the Earth's atmosphere is always varying. So the star always looks like it's varying. So classically, the right way to do photometry is look at your one star, move your telescope toward the other star, which is a known comparison star. Go back and forth, so even though the atmosphere is changing, that difference shouldn't be changing or you can correct for it. But what about your comparison star? Maybe it's variable. Your answer is wrong. So you need a reference star for your comparison star for your target star. So all night long, you're going back and forth trying to get the variability of your star. And during that night, you might get, be able to say half a dozen or so stars. And over a few weeks, you can find out whether they're variable. And then what you do after a few weeks is you take your paper chart recorder and you look at where your Galvin hour showed the brightness of that star. That's classical photometry. That's not what we were proposing. We we're proposing at least 100,000 stars simultaneously, and we're not going to touch it, touch the data. Computers are going to run the data through and look for the signal and get rid of at least some of the noise. And so they said, well, that's a grand idea. Build an observatory and show us we, you can do it. So we had to build an observatory before we could propose again. The opportunity to propose is every two years, you've got two years to build an observatory, do your observations, publish the paper, and so you can propose again. That sounded fair to us. We can do that. <laughs> Clearly, the writing of the environmental impact report for your observatory is going to take more than that time. So you can't do it in a straightforward fashion. In this particular case, NASA Ames, where I come from, is near the University of California, Santa Cruz, and they have some telescopes up on uh, Mount Hamilton. And so we went to, there, to the people there and said, look, here's, here's our idea, and what we need is a telescope dome. And they said, we have a small one that you can use. It hasn't been used in about 50 years, and so the floor is rotten, you can't walk on the floor. Uh, the dome doesn't rotate, but you could have the motor rewound. It's an 1870 motor, you have to rewind it. <laughs> And the dome leaks and the rain on your equipment. And the instrument room is full of photographic equipment. And so you just tear all that stuff out and make it work. So we did that. We got a bunch of students together who were really enthusiastic. And so we climbed up top of the dome and we sealed it up and we got the dome motor rewound. We had a new floor put in, chased the rattlesnakes out from the basement. And we built a couple of telescopes, and these show some of those little tel The telescopes are about three feet long. They're about this long. And when people come to Lick Observatory, they would say, we want to see your big telescopes. If they ever happened to see me, I would bring them up to this 14-foot dome. Because you may have a three-meter diameter telescope, but this telescope has a bigger field of view, which is what counts. You have to look at a lot of stars simultaneously. Not have a big telescope looking at one star at a time. The difficulty, of course, is at first it wasn't robotic. We didn't have everything set up to be automatic. So people went there. There were observers there. And one of our observers was here uh, as well each night. We called him Spock. Now, like Spock, he had very unusual tastes. And particularly, he liked wires and hoses and anything that ran the telescope. <laughs> so we were sort of delighted when we heard there was a big fat rattlesnake around. 
In any case, this is our, our, some of our data. Uh, the, that red curve is the prediction. Here are our measurements. It shows very nicely we were seeing a planetary transit. We did not discover that planet, but we showed this principle works. And so it allowed us then to move on to uh, other, other difficulties. Having accomplished many other difficulties, go on to the fact that ultimately they accepted our proposal and said, go build it. So this is what we built. Uh, basically, it's what's called a wide field of view, lots of stars, that can simultaneously monitor 170,000 stars. 100,000 stars should be enough, but hey, more stars the better. And so we got 170,000 stars fit into it. it. Has to have enough precision to find Earth-sized planets. So you have to have about a 10 part per million photometry for bright stars. You don't get that for dimmer stars. We have to observe for several years to detect transit patterns. We saw the sun with the spots on it. They go around, so every so often the spot comes into view, the star dims. We've got to be sure by seeing three transits. First two transits give you a period. The third one gives you the second value of the period, and it should be the same to a part in 100,000. To actually boost the signal, we really need to see four of them. So basically, we have to have a long lifetime. Because if you're saying, I want to see four transits to Earth, you better look for four years. And so that's one of the requirements. A large area of the sky, so we see lots of stars. 100 square degrees. 100 square degrees is like putting your hand out at the sky and covering that number of stars, like covering the moon 10 times over, for example, covering a big part of the Big Dipper. A regular astronomical telescope, like the Hubble Space Telescope, for example, that amount of sky that's covered is that of a grain of sand held at your arm's length. But they have superb optics. They get very sharp images. Here, we want fuzzy images. We're not taking pictures. We're measuring the brightness of a star. And if you blur it out a bit, then, you, then the pixels in your CCDs can average out that kind of, can average out some variations. We use a heliocentric orbit. And what that means is the telescope does not orbit the Earth. It orbits the sun, just like a planet. And the nice thing about that is the Earth never gets in its path, the moon doesn't, the planets don't. It sits out in space, looking at the same set of stars, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, so it doesn't miss the transits. The transits are only a few hours, and they come only like once a year, or once every few months, or once every few hours if they're really close, close in planets. And so it has to be in space so we don't look through the Earth's atmosphere, which causes so much turbulence and so much change in brightness. And we, we can, with this system, uh, basically not blink. We can just simply stare continuously at one group of stars. This mission was designed to be the most boring, dull mission ever flown. That's the way we like it. Unfortunately, it, it didn't... Uh, necessarily uh, do that, it uh, would often scare us in various fashions by shutting itself down or wandering off someplace. <laughs> so here's the system. Now we've got a telescope, big mirror here, a corrector here, light comes in here, hits this mirror, and goes onto the detectors. The detectors change that light into electrical signal, uh, record that, that signal is stored in a, a, uh, the spacecraft itself, an instrument there. That instrument, that photometer, or that part of the electronics, picks out just the pieces that are the target stars. And we've looked at this area of the sky for a period of several years with ground-based telescopes. And we have measured the brightness and colors of 4.4 million stars before we launched this. So we know what stars we want to look at. And we know which stars we don't want to look at. So we can send back just the important data. And that's important because you can't send all the data back from a system that has some 95 million pixels, they get read every six seconds, co-added, and then sent back once a month. So we've got 42 CCDs, two channels each, 84 channels, and uh, fine guidance sensors. Here's, here's what our focal plane looks like. It's about a square foot, several million dollars worth of CCDs there, covered with sapphire. That, that field of view is so large, at 100 square degrees, there is no focal plane. It focuses on a round surface. And so your detectors are flat. These lenses 
allow you to focus on flat detectors, but they, they are, we make them out of, out of sapphires. And it, it has worked beautifully. This is the Delta II uh, rocket. It's a, this one is a three-stage rocket. The, uh, our telescope sits up inside here. And these are the three stages, nine, nine solid-state boosters. This is a takeoff. This represents the work that I participated in since 1983. Thousands of people worked on this during our 1992 and 94-96 uh, proposals. So this is an extremely exciting time to watch this lift off from Cape Kennedy uh, in 2009. I used to say it was the most exciting night of my life, but my wife says no. So, <laughs> In any case, uh, this is the orbit. It's a 53-week orbit, and each year the Earth goes back to the first place to start at the beginning of the year. That's the definition of a year. But the Kepler mission is about a week behind. So the first year it's there, the second year, third year, it keeps moving further and further behind, getting further and further away, which means our data rate begins to drop as well as the mission gets further and further away. But what's especially interesting here is they're on, when you launch from a planet like the Earth, the orbit's going to come back. That spacecraft will come back to Earth. It'll come back to Earth when the Earth laps it. Well, it was launched in 2009. It takes 52 years. So something like 46 years from now, that telescope will be back where we can go get it. And I'm expecting young people here to have enough ambition, enough capability to go into space, pick up this telescope, and put it in the Air and Space Museum because it's the telescope that told us about all the planets that exist in our galaxy, how frequent they are. So it will be something special to do. Now, I think, in fact, that our young people are going to be so clever and so, have so much capability, the Air and Space Museum will be on the moon for us to go and visit. <laughs> so don't, don't keep me waiting. OK. We we look at 170,000 stars simultaneously. That's what we're looking at. We're not seeing planets. We're seeing the planet cross the star. So we see a lot, get a lot of information about stars themselves. And stars are also extremely interesting. So here is one of the more interesting uh, stars we've seen. And so here's our data. See all this jumping up and down? But you'll notice that's jumping up and down a few, a few parts per million, maybe 20 parts per million. But you're also seeing every time there's a dip, there's a dip, there's a dip, there's a dip. And then there's big ones as well. So if we overlay that data, we can push, we can make the, 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 the results look sharper, uh, improve the, improve the uh, resolution. And if we look here, we've replotted the small dips. And that's what it looks like. The red curve is the curve we fit to the data. It comes along straight. We have done some getting rid of curves here. But you see the, the, the object, that's orbit, the ob orbiting object, cross the edge of the star. It took a while. It's, it generally takes something in the order of half an hour, 15 minutes. Then we see this rather smooth, round bottom. That's because as this object moves across the star, it blocks the edge of the star first. And the edges of stars aren't very bright. It's the center that's particularly bright. They're called limb darkened. And so this is the kind of characteristic transit we're looking for. The depth tells us how big this planet is. Well, how big is it? And the answer is it's 8 tenths the size of Jupiter, our Jupiter. Now, Jupiter is 11 times the size of the Earth, or uh, for engineering's sake, 10 times. So this object is 8 times the size of the Earth. It's a pretty big object. Jupiter is the biggest planet in our solar system. And it's blocked some 500 parts per million of light. But when a planet goes around the back of the star, the star blocks all of its light. Now, planets reflect generally a part in a billion of the light from the star. That's not true with all planets. Some planets are very big and very close. So you see more of that, and you look for that light during, or you look for the change in the light during the occultation. The occultation is when the orbiting object moves behind your star. Look what happened here. The dip is bigger than when the planet crossed the star. How could that be? What it means is this object 
per unit area was brighter than the star it crossed. So when it went behind the star, it lost even more light. Notice it's flat. There is no light penetrating that star. It comes down like it should, goes back up like it should, but now the dip is bigger than the planet itself. First thing you think about, oh, this is a, a white dwarf. Well, a white dwarf is a star that's burned up all its helium, blown away much of its atmosphere, and you say, well, sure, those, those are small. But if you look in your textbooks, and I assume that uh, people look through their textbooks, how big are white dwarfs? They're the size of the Earth. This thing's eight times bigger. So this is something special. In fact, what we think it is, is that when you look up in the sky and you, 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 sing, see, sing, you think you see single stars, you're often seeing double stars. This, we believe, is a double star. And so the two stars were born together, they circled each other. One was a big star, one was a small star. One had a lot of mass, one had very little mass. Well, the big brother burned through all of his hydrogen very, very rapidly. Because if you're massive, you burn all your fuel very quickly. And as you do, the star starts to expand, and the unburned hydrogen gets in the way of the little star. The little star picks all that hydrogen up and becomes a bright star. So all that's left of the big brother is just a hot, cooling core. And I think that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing a core that's some 12,000 Kelvin, that's twice the temperature of the sun, around the star that's 9,400 Kelvin also a very hot star. And we see a number of these things. So very unusual, but uh, if you look at 170,000 stars, a lot of interesting things are found. Now we're looking for transits. We're looking for a dip when a planet goes across a star. So what we found here is spikes. It's getting really bright. Then we see all these little waves next to it. And again, if you add these things together to, to increase the resolution, what you see is here. Here are all the little waves. Here's this great big spike. Here are all these little waves. When we first saw that, we said, well, gee, maybe we've got a, a white dwarf. We've got a microlensing micro event, something like that. We got some a very good spectrum. What we found was we had two very hot stars. They're called A stars, bigger, more massive than the sun. And what's happening is, is that these two stars orbit each other, but they don't orbit each other in a circle. They're almost on a line. They pull away from each other and they shoot back at each other. And so it's something like this. Here's a star far away. This is a star far away. Then it gets a little bit closer. It's still circular. Here it's getting close to, the, to, to e each other. And they're now elliptical shaped. They're now pointed at each other. They pass each other by just the diameter of one star. And so these aren't spheres at all. They're pulled out. And so we see a lot more light that way. And that explains what we're seeing here. I haven't any idea how you would form two stars in a straight line. I can see that with an accretion disk circling each other, but straight lines? Where they just miss each other? Why haven't they collided? In any case, lots of myster mysteries out there. When we look at the sun, or we look at any star, one of the things we see is that it's, they're, they're noisy. Uh, on the sun, we have all this convective energy, like in a thunderstorm, all this rising hot material goes to the surface, falls back down. And this bouncing of this material is like continuous thunderstorms, hundreds of thousands of thunderstorms. So those stars make a lot of noise, sonic noise. And the sonic noise goes down into the planet like a seismic wave, acoustic wave does on Earth. The acoustic waves on Earth tell us about the core of the Earth, the structure of the Earth. This is going to tell us about the core of these stars. And when we see a young star with the, the sound waves going through, uh, it's like a drum. Certain tones are picked up. And these tones are shown here. See the one tone, another tone? We're seeing how energy in each of these different tones. And this is the, sort of the period of the frequency, if you'd like. This is slow. This is a, a high tone. As a star gets older, it gets bigger. It starts puffing out, and so the tone gets lower. So here's a lower tone. As the star gets older, another lower tone, even lower tones. But now they don't quite look like this. This is a beautiful spectrum. Nice lines, well-spaced. And if you look carefully at some of these lines, they're split. So there's a, a big spacing and a small spacing. And we're going to use that information. Here, they're all together at very, very low frequencies, weeks go by as these tones occur. 
what that's telling us is this star has expanded and what we're seeing is the core of that star and its waves. It's, it's a fluid and so it's got gravity waves like the ocean does. Those waves mix with your acoustic waves and you get this very complicated hybrid system. But that tells us what's happening in that star. We can plot the, the distance between the splitting of those lines and the lines themselves and make a plot uh, like this one where we were talking about the splitting in one direction, the large splitting in another direction. And you plot the points that you measured from those oscillations you were measuring. And if the points plot along here, it's saying, this is a star that's gotten old, and it has finished burning the hydrogen in its core. That's where the sun gets its hydrogen. It's hot in the core, hundreds of millions of degrees. That's where the hydrogen fuses to helium. But after it's burned up that hydrogen, what does the star do? The answer is the core begins to contract and get hotter. That allows the hydrogen burning to occur in a shell, and the shell of the star is, is fusing hydrogen to helium and expanding outward. Well, that hydrogen, of course, is forming helium. The helium pours down into the core. The core gets more massive, gets hotter. And finally, the core lights up, and the core begins to, to fuse helium to make carbon and oxygen and nitrogen. In other words, to make us. And if it's burning helium, it's here. The points will lie up here. So we can look at a star, a red giant, which just looks like a big red star to the outside. But we can look inside and see what's happening. It's what will happen to our sun someday. So we can study uh, stars and learn something that's of interest to our own solar system uh, in the future. Okay, people are not interested as, uh, quite as much uh, in stars as they are in planets. That's what you're here for. Let's talk about planets. When you talk about planets, we like to think of our own solar system. It's a good paradigm. The paradigm that's been around for a long, long time is giant molecular clouds, millions or hundreds of thousands of mass of the sun. Every so often, this giant cloud gets bothered. Supernova goes off, compresses part of this, this cloud, and that material as it's compressed together, begins to have enough gravity to pull itself together. So it pulls itself together and shrinks. It still has momentum, so it spins into a disk as it does so. So that dust and gas is spinning into a flat disk. And we think, ah, oh, that's how our solar system was formed. And the material falls into the star to form the star. The clumps out here form the planets. Now, the outer planets, of course, well, the inner planets are close to the star. So they're so hot that when you build this planet, you can't condense the helium and the hydrogen gases are too light. You can't condense water vapor. It's too hot. Can't condense CO2. So all you can condense are rocks. So that's why our inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, are just a pile of rocks with not much water and not much atmosphere. A little bit, but not a percent of the mass. Outer, when you're further out, things are cooler. Your circumference is bigger. You can grab this hydrogen, helium, and grab this dust, build a planet that's massive enough to attract the hydrogen helium, to build a gas giant like Jupiter or Saturn, Uranus or Neptune. So this makes lots of sense. It makes sense in that this disk spawned all these planets. They all move prograde, same direction. Most of them have spin axes perpendicular to that direction. There's the, the disk here lies in the, plane, the equatorial plane of your star. In other words, the spin axis of it, too, points perpendicularly. So it explains an awful lot of what we see. Now, we only had one example until recently of a planetary system, and this was our explanation as to how they formed. And we knew, we knew because the science groups wrote NASA headquarters that you don't have to look for Earths, spend all that money. All you have to do is look for Jupiters. They'll be out there at, you know, at five astronomical units, and the little guys will be there too, so don't worry about it. Uh, that is, of course, not what we found. You really need to go out and make the measurements. Well, what, has, what has Kepler done for us? And the answer is here is what Kepler has done for us. This is uh, the size of the planet we found. These are the planets that we have found. Some of them are still candidates. We still have to do some confirmation. This is the orbital period. So the Earth is here. It's at 1. 
Neptune is here at 4. There's Jupiter at 11. And so our Earth is here at 365 days. But what we see is this huge pile of planets, huge number of planets between the size of the Earth and the size of Neptune. There are no such planets in our own solar system. And we'll talk about what they might be. The other thing that you note is that uh, they have rather short periods. You know, you've got periods of one day here and shorter, 10 days here, huge number of planets close into their star, orbiting very, very rapidly. If you had a, we have some planets here which have orbital periods of the order of 24 hours. Imagine you live in such a planet. You get up in the morning, it's spring, you know. <laughs> uh, at noon, you know, the trees are beginning to, to blossom and you're beginning to get some apples and whatnot. And in the evening, you pick your apples and carrots and whatever. You go to bed, it's fall, it's, it's winter comes, get up in the morning, it's spring again. So the, that's a very fast year. And we're seeing years faster than that even. But they're so close to their star. That's not uh, as likely. I'll, I'll show you somewhere it probably does happen. So we're seeing another thing here. Look at this group of planets bigger than Jupiter. Now, if you studied your astronomy, you know there cannot be a planet bigger than Jupiter. The reason you can't have a planet bigger than Jupiter because Jupiter is already the size of a small star. And if you throw something into it, megaton of, of hydrogen and helium, it gets denser. You throw the Earth in, same thing. Earth dissolves and that planet does not get bigger. It gets denser and denser until finally uh, it, when it gets enough mass, it can become a star. <clears throat> so how can you have planets bigger than Jupiter? We see a lot of planets bigger than Jupiter. And I will talk about that in a minute. But again, it was one of the interesting discoveries that we made that helps us to understand uh, the exoplanets and planetary systems, including our own, are much more complicated, much more interesting than one would have guessed. We talked about the fact we've seen an awful lot of objects that are, uh, have orbital periods of a day or less. And here are some of them. This is, I oh, don't do that. <clears throat> go back. Don't go back that far. There we go. <clears throat> the little table. Orbital period, 9 hours, 16 hours, 22 hours. Temperature of some of these objects, 2100 Kelvin, 1850 Kelvin. Now, 2100 Kelvin is not the temperature of molten lava. It's the temperature of molten iron. 1850 is the temperature of molten lava. So these things are really hot. This little object is going past the, its star in some nine hours, and it is disappearing. The entire planet is evaporating. Our estimate of lifetimes of the order of 100 million years, so it does take a while. But everything, rocks, iron, everything, is evaporating from this object. We also find uh, very massive objects. These things are rather light. This is a very massive object. Three times the mass of the Earth, one and a half times the size of the Earth. But also, its, it's 20 hour orbital period means it's at, at the temperature of molten lava. So one side is completely molten. You've got oceans of lava. If that heat's carried around the back, maybe you have it there as well. But it's very likely that this thing is tidally locked. One, faces, one side faces a star. It's mold, the other side is simply frozen solid. Again, uh, not someplace you, you would look for life. We talked about Jupiter's. Uh, and what we see here is, I've got Jupiter here for reference size. This is the size, one radius of Jupiter, by definition. Its mass is one mass of Jupiter. Its density is 1.3 grams per cc. Water is one. Earth is 5.5. So this is quite a bit less dense than the Earth. But we've got one that's 10% smaller. Its density is 0 0.05. That planet, almost the size of Jupiter, approximately 1,000 times the volume of the Earth, has a density of a styrofoam coffee cup. I don't know how that can be. But if we continue on, we see another planet that's 10% bigger than Jupiter. Densi uh, mass, about 18. Density, 17 grams per cc. That is not the density of iron. It's way above iron. It's not the density of lead either. It's way above lead. 
This is the density of gold and platinum. Now, when you see the picture alien, I don't know if anybody's seen alien, but <laughs> the spaceship comes back, it's an ore carrier. Where do you think it was? It was at this planet gobbling up all this platinum and gold. It knew, it knew where, where to go. And so, a huge variety of planets. This planet is quite a bit bigger, and as I say, we see planets uh, two or three times si bigger than Jupiter. These are all confirmed planets. But what this is telling us is something inflates these planets. There is a, a, a physical process that we haven't been clever enough to figure out. But we have very uh, imaginative um, theoreticians, and they imagine that like on Jupiter, and then on, on Saturn, you have very strong winds. They move 1,000 miles an hour. Even our jet stream moves pretty fast. And if the planet's big, these winds are down low inside. They're hot. They're so hot that, say, sodium is ionized. And that becomes an electrical conductor. So you've got a conducting current there. And you've got a magnetic field. Current, magnetic field. You're generating electricity. And that dissipation is heating the center of the planet. And that's what's causing it to inflate. Now, I don't know that's true, but it's an interesting theory. And there are a number of other rather clever ways of trying to explain these really interesting things that Kepler has found. What have we found? What are the statistics like? One of the things you always have to remember is there are things you see and there are things you don't see. And so we talk about a sample distribution. What did you find? This is what we found. 800 Earth-sized planets. 1,200 super-Earths, about one and a half times to twice the size. Huge number of uh, Neptune-sized planets. Not very many Jupiters, even less bigger planets. But we know it's extremely hard to find a small planet. It's hard to find a small planet because the signal is never very big. It's a hundred times smaller than that of Jupiter. It's hard to find it on a big star because the ratio is so small. It's hard to find little planets on noisy stars, and a lot of stars are noisy. But it's easy to find a big planet. So we, are, we have a very biased measurement of what is actually out there. We know there must be a lot of smaller planets that we have missed. We can do the corrections. We can correct much of those biases. And that, agreed, takes supercomputers. But we have the supercomputers, and we use them. And so basically, one of the studies shows that as you go from larger planets like Neptune to smaller and smaller planets, the number goes up and up and up. Here we don't have enough data to be sure. But what we are seeing is if you correct the data by how many stars you can see a small planet versus how many you can see a large planet, you can actually begin the, to calculate the number of planets per star on average. Uh, and what you see here is for planets about the size of the Earth, on average 50% of the stars in our galaxy will have planets about the size of our Earth. An additional 25%, they'll be maybe one and a half times the size of the Earth. 20% more, about twi full twice the size of the Earth, all of which could be rocky. Now, the bigger ones, less likely. The smaller ones, more sh certain that they would be rocky. Add the numbers up, and you get one. This is saying that on average, every star in our galaxy, not every, all the stars in our galaxy have on average one planet that's roughly Earth-sized orbiting them. The latest calculations actually push that up to two, but it's one or two, and I used one for the calculation. There are approximately 100 billion stars in our galaxy. People make those kinds of measurements. Now, granted, make those kinds of measurements. And if you count the little red dwarfs that are so frequent, the little red stars, that number goes up to 300 billion. And we certainly see planets around these small, small stars. So there must be at least a hundred billion planets, or several hundred billion planets, around other stars. And that's telling us that Kepler's been very successful. We know the answer. There are a lot of Earth-sized planets out there. We don't know how many are in the habitable zone. Another thing that we found, you know, we're thinking about, we're thinking of this paradigm of this disk. Rocky planets, but close to the star, big ones far out. We know that part of that's wrong, right? Because we saw all these giant planets with one-day orbits and two-day orbits and ten-day orbits. So we know, we got a pretty good suspicion that they must have formed where they formed because of lots of material. And then they came in toward, their, toward the sun. 
And you can see where that would happen. The planet has a certain amount of what we call potential energy, energy that's holding it away from the, the, the star. It's very much, I like to think of it very much like you've got a power boat, you're in a power boat, you're roaring across the lake, you're making a big wave. What happens when you turn off the motor? The wave pulls the energy, pulls the momentum out of the boat and the boat stops. Well, that's happening here. These planets are going through that disk, generating a wave, and they're losing momentum, they're losing energy, and they're spiraling in toward their star. And so that explains what we saw earlier. And it may explain what we see here. Because up to now, we've said, if I find two planets that have nearly the identical orbits around the same star, this planet has uh, a distance from a star of 0.12 AU. That's a tenth of the distance from the Earth to the Sun. But this one has 0.13. They almost hit each other as they go around. So they should both be rocky planets. They're close to the star. It's hot. They should be rocky planets, according to our paradigm. Well, they're not. This one uh, is, has a density of 7.5 grams per cc. Earth is 5.5. Iron is about 8. So this thing is sort of an iron ball with a silicon crust, probably. The planet right next to it has a density of 0 0.9 grams per cc, less dense than water. So how can you explain that? Well, one of the ways of explaining it is the way we explain Jupiter. This planet came spiraling in. Before it struck this other planet, the dust and gas was blown away. Or there was a gravitational interaction that caused these two planets to keep themselves separate. Again, a surprise. It's telling us that when our solar system formed, it may not have looked like it looks today. The planets may have moved around a fair piece uh, at the beginning. Okay, uh, when, you, when you go out at night, sometimes you wish upon a star. About half the time, you're not wishing upon a star, you're wishing upon a double star. Now, I don't know whether that doubles your chance of getting your wish, but there are an awful lot of double stars out there. About half of them are double stars. So the question is, can you have a planet orbiting a, orbiting a double star? For a long time, people felt, no, the interaction of the two stars would throw the planet out of the, solar, out of the planetary system. So, one of the things you want to do is check. And so we find, in fact, planets orbiting double stars. Here is our a double star. Now, we, when we found this planet orbiting this double star, we called George Lucas and said, in, in Star Wars, you made a mistake. Now, there's an error. You painted the big one red and the small one white. But that never happens. The big one, that's the hot star. It's, it's going to be white. So he sent some of his, his team over to learn a little bit of astronomy from us. Enjoyed the joke. But this planet is not the home of Luke Skywalker. It turns out this planet is at 100, minus 126 Fahrenheit, and that's too cold for farming. So obviously, we have got to look further. We do. We, we're looking further. We'd like to find Luke Skywalker summon, and here's a possibility. Here's another double star, two stars. This is a planetary system with two planets. This planet is in the habitable zone. It does have the right temperatures for life, but it's too big. It's like Neptune. It's got a gas atmosphere, a big hydrogen helium atmosphere, probably. So we don't think any life can exist on it. But if you've got a big planet, you often have lots of moons. In our solar system, we have moons like Titan, which have a massive atmosphere. Now, does this moon, if, if there, does this planet have moons? We don't know, but we see a lot of giant planets in the habitable zone, and we lo we're looking for those moons. Occasionally people say, oh, I found one. Then they check more carefully. No, they haven't found one yet, but they're, they're certainly looking. This is my favorite planet. This is Kepler 22b. It's in the habitable zone. It's 2.4 times the size of the Earth. The orbital period is similar to that of the Earth, 290 days, a smidgen less. It's in a habitable zone. It's too big for Earth, right? The Earth is only one. Neptune is four. This isn't like any planet in our solar system. And it represents a lot of the planets that we have found. There's this huge flock of planets between the size of Neptune and the size of Earth. Is it a sort of super Earth, big rocky thing? Eh, People don't, don't like that so much. Is it a mini Neptune? 
we're not sure what you mean by a mini Neptune. But what the theoreticians say is what this could represent is a water planet, a planet composed mostly of water. So here is a planet covered with an ocean, in the habitable zone. Now if it's an ocean, it's water. Water evaporates. So now you've got an atmosphere of water vapor. In our galaxy, we see a lot of CO, CO2, so it's probably got CO2 in the atmosphere. In our solar system, nitrogen is fairly common. So we've got an atmosphere possibly of CO2, nitrogen, and water vapor. That's exactly what you need for life. Not oxygen for us, but there are an awful lot of creatures that, that would love this as an atmosphere. So does this ocean have life? The Kepler wasn't designed to answer that question. Uh, the young people are going to have to build the missions that go and answer that question. So I hope they're paying attention. Well, we're still not satisfied. We, I, you know, you want to find a planet that's at 1.0 the size of the Earth, right in the habitable zone, exactly like the Earth, around the star, exactly like the sun. We haven't found that we, well, we're getting close. Here is a planetary system that we found. Uh, here's the Earth, a solar system. There's our star. The green areas where you could have water on a rocky planet. It's not so hot that the water boils, not so cold that it freezes. It's called a habitable zone. This is Kepler-62. Its habitable zone is closer to its star because the star is smaller and cooler. It has two planets that are about Earth size, 1.4, 1.6 times the size of the Earth. And so they're probably rocky. They're in a habitable zone. Do they have life? We need to build new missions. Could we find planets that are closer in size to the Earth? And the answer is sure. Here is another system we found called Kepler 186f. The star is even smaller, but it has a planet in the habitable zone, essentially exactly the size of the Earth, plus or minus, I think, 10% the, the diameter. And so we are finding planets. We are finding roughly Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone. But they're generally of stars that are smaller and cooler. The easier to find the planet, the orbit of period is shorter. And so that means that for smaller stars, we can find uh, smaller planets. And you've all, I think, heard about the TRAPPIST system. This is a star that was, uh, and planets that were announced a few months ago. It has seven planets, three of which are expected to be in a habitable zone. You say, well, that's great. What about this star? This star is one of the tiniest stars that I think anybody's ever found. It's, this star is the size of Jupiter, essentially. It's a very tiny star. So you've got to really cuddle up to it to be warm enough. So the orbital periods here are hours or a few days. Does, do they have life? We don't know again. But when you're that close to a star and it, it has solar events, X-ray events, gamma ray, not gamma ray, X-ray events, you tend to sterilize any life that might be there. On the other hand, many of these planets were probably tightly locked. So if you live on the other side and the warmth is brought to you from the atmosphere, maybe that's okay. We don't know, but again, we do find a lot of roughly Earth-sized planets, and we find a fair number of them in the habitable zone. This is a, a sketch of that different Different uh, stars, ah, I don't want to do that. This is the sun, smaller and smaller stars. The green area is the habitable zone. And if this is a dark, a bright green area, it's, it would be sort of like the Earth in, in the sense that uh, you don't have to do anything special. The temperatures with an atmosphere like the Earth would be uh, quite good for liquid water on the surface. But out here where you're too close to the sun, what this is telling you, well, what if you had some reflective clouds that were just right? They'd reflect away some of that heat, and you could have habitable planets here. Similarly, over here, you're too cold. You ought to freeze the oceans. Not really. If you had some clouds that kept the heat in, you could extend out that far. So this is both the conservative, the conservative and the more liberal habitable zones, and we're interested in planets in all these areas. And this is a plot just of planets roughly Earth-sized, not the other bigger planets that might have moons in the habitable zone. This, this slide is one of my, my, my favorites. What it does is it's going to look at our solar system, compare some other solar systems. Here is our solar system. Earth, Venus, Mars, 
and the size of the circle tells you how big the planet is. The scale here is the distance to the star, to the sun. But it's logarithmic. So this is a hundredth the distance to, to, from the Earth to the star. A tenth, one, that's where the Earth uh, would be. At ten times, which is roughly where Saturn might be. And so we've taken a lot of these planetary systems and we put them on the same scale. And so we see a bunch that are quite close to their stars here. But what's interesting is Kepler 444. Five planets roughly the size of the Earth. Close to their star, small. They can't hold a big gas atmosphere. These planets are almost certainly rocky planets. Now, they're, what's especially interesting is this star, V444, is dated to be six billion years older than our Sun. So, right from the beginning of our galaxy, some nine, ten billion years ago, the stars were already forming planets, rocky planets out of silicates and iron and so on. And so life might have started even that early and continuously from the beginning of the formation of the galaxy, you had planets being built that were rocky planets that have conceivably could have life. Can you imagine life a thousand years from now, a million years from now? You know, you can imagine this is between the dinosaurs and us. Now that's, those are trivial times. We're talking about six billion years. So if there's life out there, it might be really interesting life. This is the most mysterious object that we have ever found. The data is shown at the top. This is the brightness of the star. It's normalized to one. And it comes along and there's some little dips here. Then there's a big dip, another little dip, and a bunch of big dips. Strange, it's not repetitive. And if you magnify each of those curves, you magnify this curve, it looks like this. Do you remember what the curve looked like for that object orbiting that really hot star? It was round-shaped in the bottom. When around the back, it was flat-shaped. This doesn't look anything like. It's unlike anything we have ever seen. We have no idea how you would produce this. I shouldn't say that, we do have ideas. But we have no solid ideas as to how you would produce this. And you look at the rest of these things, very complicated curves, completely unrelated to kinds of curves that we have seen. So what could it be? Well, the uh, young woman that discovered this, uh, imagine that you had lots of uh, comets coming together. Most of the time when you look through a comet's tail, you can see stars, they're almost transparent. So it takes a huge number of comets to do this. So that seems unlikely. Maybe two planets crash together and all the debris is in orbit, and that's what we're seeing. Seems unlikely. But what people are saying is, you know, you're looking at all these planets, you're looking at all these stars, what if we're seeing an advanced civilization? Some of us have heard of Dyson spheres, that people have outgrown their planets. Well, what do you do? You got all these asteroids around, they're not good for much. Let's build a planet out of them. Let's build a shell and take that sunlight and move out into this shell. You know, if you look at the Earth's iron core, what good does it do you? Take it out and build a planet out of it, okay? So maybe that's what we're seeing here. The signal is very big, though. Look at the size of the signal. That's a 20% change in star brightness. How would you build something that blocked out 20% of a star's light? If it was half the diameter of the star, that square would be the area. So it would block out about 25%, 20% of the star's light. So all you have to do is build something half the diameter of a star. The diameter of a star is about a million miles. So you don't have to build something 500,000 miles in size. So if it's advanced civilization, they've got some engineering technology we'd like to hear about. So, very mysterious object. And basically, uh, I'm going to conclude here. What have we learned? Uh, basically, most stars have planets. Planets' this systems have been forming from the beginning of our galaxy. The beginning of our galaxy, if you look out from your planet at the nighttime sky, you would never see the Milky Way. It hadn't been built yet. Earth-sized planets are common. Planets are unlike, many planets are unlike any in our solar system. Planets of all sizes are found in the habitable zone. And we have to think about the implications. We know, we're not guessing, that there are a hundred billion or more planets out there. That's, I'm sure, a big underestimate. 
We know a fair number of them are Earth-sized. We know a fair number of them are habitable zone. Well, why hasn't SETI heard from them? The Fermi paradox is not a, an intellectual joke anymore. It's real. SETI has looked for 30 years and not heard a signal. Why not? Maybe our assumptions that any planet that has, is suitable for life, it's got the right temperatures and things like that, maybe that doesn't, doesn't mean it forms life. Life is just very, very unusual in its formation. That's a possible theory. That would explain things. Another possibility is, no, no, it occurs very frequently, but it evolves only to the bacterial level, like in our precambian that lasted for a billion years. It doesn't get any further. No, another theory is it gets well past that and to upper, uh, higher, higher creatures, higher levels of creatures. The dinosaurs, very complicated animals with big brains that roamed the earth for 20, 30 million years. But they never contacted us because they didn't build a technology civilization. Okay? So maybe another theory is that they do get to technology civilization fairly often. But that means a catastrophe occurs. Maybe they're not clever enough to avoid an impact by an asteroid. They weren't fast enough with their development of their spacecraft. Or maybe there's some other catastrophe they could think up for themselves. But it's a very important question now, because now we know there are a lot of planets out there that might have life. And so one of the questions we face is what are we going to do to learn the answers? And I will uh, talk about my own organization. NASA is working at this. And so to see the NASA set of missions, the Hubble, the Spitzer, the Kepler mission, TESS will be looking for planets. It launches next year. So does JWST. It can tell you something about the atmospheres of some of the bigger planets. And the Europeans have been flying uh, Koro. Koro has found planets. Gaia is looking at stars, trying to understand the stars and some of the planets around them. Kiops will be looking at uh, planets, stars that are already known to have planets. Plato will launch in 2025, again looking for planets. What we're expecting to do is to get together with the Europeans and build a world telescope. The World Telescope will be an enormous telescope in space that will get enough photons so you can actually see the light from the planet, not from the light from the star, and you can block out the light from the star. You can get spectra. You can say, ah, that planet has got a, an atmosphere. It's got an ocean. Maybe it has biosignatures. I'd love to see it say, ah, we found an atmosphere with freons. Only humans make freons. So, thank you for your, uh, your attention. All right. So, Maybe Michael will start up the conversations, and if we could have some of our volunteers collect the, uh, the questions from the audience, that'd be great. Um, Please write legibly. We can't ask <laughs> a question if we can't read a question. So please write clearly. Thank you, Bill. That's great. We're all a lot smarter about exoplanets now and the Kepler mission. I was wondering, 20 years ago, we thought that our solar system was prototypical of what solar systems we would yes. find. We would have these little rocky planets, we would have a snow line, and then you would have these big gas giants all orbiting very stately and stable. Instead, we have found this incredible menagerie of solar systems, hot Jupiter, super Earth, all sorts of interactions. Is this suggesting, do you think, that our solar system is really relatively unique and what does this say about the evolution of solar systems and the chance for life in solar systems? Well certainly everything that we have found has been quite different than our solar system. Uh, so clearly we, if we're not one of a kind it's certainly systems like our, our solar system are unusual. <laughs> now we haven't finished the exploration out there. We need to look for the giant planets to see how many are still out there because Giant planets can deflect comets and asteroids that might destroy, destroy life on the Earth. So there are, the W-1st mission 
will be one of the things that will tell us about that. Thank you. But certainly up to now, we certainly don't see anything that looks like our own solar system. Bill, have, did Kepler find any planets that looked like they had giant ring systems, like our Saturn has a giant ring system? People would love to find rings around planets, moons around planets, and they're looking very, very hard. But the state of the art, the t state of what we can just barely do with our technology is in Kepler. So we can find the planet, but we haven't yet been able to build the technology and the telescopes to do better. To f a, a ring would, would change the area of a planet, because we don't resolve the planet. We just s tell you a certain amount of the star is blocked. But if you're clever, you can say, when that planet went across the star, there was a little dip, and then the planet went across, and there was another little dip when it left. Or if it was canted, then the, when it went in and when it exited, would look a little bit different. So people are looking very hard in several different ways to find planets and to find rings, but they haven't done it yet. You didn't mention this in your talk, and perhaps I'm misinformed, but my understanding is that in some cases we have discovered retrograde planets. A retrograde planet is a planet that is not orbiting in the same direction as the spin axis and the other planets in the system, which seems strange because we assume that it all formed from a protoplanetary disk, all orbiting in the same direction, yet you got this critter that's going in the wrong opposite. way. Did you discover something like that? And are there theories yes. about that? Something of the order. <coughs> 20% of the giant planets, particularly in the close in orbits, show that sort of thing. Instead of all the planets going around together, they're going around backwards. Now, how can that happen? Uh, I was talking to one of the professors here, uh, William Newman, and he was telling me that, of course, that's the sort of thing he and his group uh, have looked into. And there are people that point out that, you know, if you've got a planet orbiting a star and there's a third object, the third object, whether it's a star or another big planet, can start exchanging momentum. And the eccentricity of that orbit starts changing. But as the eccentricity changes, it begins to move out of the plane. It can move out so far that it's actually going in the opposite direction. But it's, at least a good part of the time, it will go back again because it's, it's something that's repetitive. Sometimes that doesn't happen and that as it does this, the orbit's getting very elliptical. Elliptical means that the semi-major axis stays the same length, but it goes, the planet goes very close to the star. When it goes close to the star, it raises a tide on the star. The star slows the planet down and begins to circularize its orbit. So if this happens, you've got Jupiter formed out, or Jupiter's formed, something else bothers Jupiter, it tilts, the eccentricity changes, it gets close to the star, orbit gets circularized, and now you can explain the Jupiters that have four-day orbits. So people are thinking seriously about that, and people who study the dynamics of stars and asteroids love these kinds of data sets because it gives them a chance to practice uh, their specialty. Here we have a question from the audience, and it's, why do we seem to be so focused on looking at Earth-sized planets, trying to discover Earth-sized planets from the standpoint of habitability? Isn't it all just relative? And a bigger planet with a bigger star farther away could be just as habitable as an Earth-sized planet? That's a good, very good question. Uh, basically, why we're picking small planets is that as the planet gets bigger, it tends to be massive, attract the hydrogen and helium from that was this original disk from which it formed. But if you or I walked into Jupiter or dropped your Earth into Jupiter, it would dissolve. So we don't believe life can exist in a big planet because it'll have a massive hydrogen-helium atmosphere that basically will prevent life from existing. Now Carl Sagan used to say, well, maybe you could have life on Jupiter, which is a hydrogen-helium planet, because these little floaters, which would all be denser than the atmosphere, would fly all the time and they wouldn't fall down to the bottom. But I, you know, I let Carl Sagan try to defend that one. Here's a question about an exo-Kepler, if there were some alien civilizations, Kepler telescope out in space, what would it take for them to be able to detect the Earth? Well, basically the same thing as Kepler. Uh, that is to say, uh, in fact, we, we recognize that as an important 
consideration because when we see a transit, that's basically saying that the shadow is lined up. Their shadow is lined up with our shadow on our sun. So if we see a transit of them on their star, they should see a transit of Earth on our star. So when SETI, now, I don't know how many people, know, people have seen contact. And Jill Tarter. Well, Jill Tarter was, you know, the person at which Jodie Foster was model, modeling. Jill Tarter is part of our group. So as soon as we find an interesting planet, the telescopes all point at that planet to see if they, they hear a signal. But those are the planets of most interest because they're the ones that could detect readily the Earth. And they're the ones most likely to send us a signal. So they're logical that we would go and look at those planets particularly long to see if they send, are sending us a radio signal. Do you think it's possible that there could be intelligent life on an exoplanet, but that its forms of communication are such that we would not recognize it as communication, or their, their biosignature would be such that we would not recognize it as a biosignature? I, I think that's, that's certainly very, very likely, in fact. Uh, you know, it's hard to talk to a dog, but at least you can talk to a dog. A dog will basically understand what you're saying, okay? <laughs> You go and talk to a dolphin. That's really much harder. But people, uh, Hertzing, uh, what's Hertzing's first name? Hertz, Dr. Hertzing has been looking, talking with, with dolphins. And when she lives with them for a summer, when her students live with them, uh, you find their communication is partially visual. It's not just auditory. It's if you, for example, dolphins have to communicate that kids should be obey. Otherwise, they get in trouble, right? So how does the dolphin mother tell the dolphin young to behave? If they don't verbally say that. What they do is the mother will, will swim above the, the, the young one and push it to the bottom. Now, dolphins have to breathe. It doesn't take them too long to figure out. They better obey mama. <laughs> so you need... Communication can be a lot more than audio communication. The visual aspects are important as well. And so I, I think that communication among species that we have never lived with in the ocean or anywhere else is going to be very, very difficult. Uh, there was a, a movie recently. What was the name of the movie? Arrival. All right. Arrival, yes. I think that trying to point that out, it could be very difficult because they are looking at time differently than we look at time. So. I wouldn't be surprised to find it was very difficult for us to communicate with other civilizations. And maybe that's an answer. Okay. But you didn't uh, touch on this in the talk. Did Kepler discover any exomoons orbiting planets? And do you believe that future technology will be able to do this if Kepler did not? I did talk about it. Uh, and I do think, and, and astronomers that I work with all think it's quite likely that there are moons around some of these giant planets. And in fact, these moons might be as big as the Earth. So you might have a big giant planet in habitable zone and get the, the Earth orbiting it because these things are a thousand times the volume, 100 times the, 300 times the mass of the Earth. So people think there may be moons and there may be, and what was the other part of the question? Uh, just, Will Kepler detect them? Would Kepler be able to? Oh, Kepler would they be able to find it? Yeah. They're looking for it. They think Kepler might find it. It's, the difficulty is, if the moon is orbiting a planet, the planet orbits the star, and you can say, oh, that's when the transit occurred. But when did the transit of the moon occur? The moon could have been ahead of the planet or behind the planet. So it's not regular. So it's more difficult to find. But I certainly believe that new technology, and I think we need another Kepler telescope out there to continue the search, would be able to do that. A bigger telescope with some more uh, refined electronics. The transit method is a very powerful method, uh, but it's limited because stars have to be in the line of sight and there's time parameters. For instance, Neptune has a long orbit, 160, 65 years. It would take a long time to see a transit of Neptune around mm -hmm. the sun. So how are we going to get a bigger picture of the complete menagerie of solar systems? How, how if we can't, can't use transits, what will we be able to use to fill in the, the picture of solar systems at different angles and with longer times? And 
the astronomy community feels that's a very, very critically important question. You know, because we, Kepler tends to find the inner planets. The probability is highest. You know, diameter to start, diameter of the orbit, the orbit contract, we have a higher chance of seeing it. If you do radio velocity, which is another way of finding planets, it's similar. But there are methods called microlensing, which tend to look for planets further out. One of the pictures there was of a, a mission that will launch probably 20, 25, something like that. And it will look for the outer planets f because of what's called microlensing. Microlensing is if you've got your telescope and you're looking at the center of our galaxy, it's just covered solid with stars. And so if you've got a star between the Earth and that far away galaxy, uh, uh, center of the galaxy, the light coming from the center of the galaxy will come and curve around and brighten up. So you see a brightening of, of a particular star because the, there's a star between you and it, and that star might have a planet. And that planet will show a little glitch. So it will search for planets around stars. And they'll generally be at distance of Mars, then there's Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. And so they will and they look for those things. We know they'll succeed because even ground-based, they've already found some. One in our audience is wondering, how in the world do you get a good estimate of the number of stars in our galaxy? That's a classical problem. You know, if you're manufacturing, a typical example is, you're manufacturing light bulbs. And you're going to claim that your light bulbs all last 2,000 hours. Well, you know, how do you know that you've ma just manufactured a bunch that they do last 2,000. You don't take them all and run them until they burn out. That's not going to make any profit for you. You take 10 of them and you run them for that length of time and see what their usual burnout rate is. So when you go at the, look at the sky and say, ooh, look at all the stars, take a patch, count all the stars in that patch. And say, well, the, that's one square degree. There are 40,000 square degrees in a sphere. Multiply by 40,000 and you've got your answer. The Hubble Space Telescope Hubble Space Telescope tracks objects. It looks at objects, stars and galaxies and things like that. But it has to guide because the sun is always pushing telescopes around and, and magnetic fields are as well. So they mapped the entire uh, sky for stars down to like 25th or 26th magnitude. So you can count in little areas. How many stars there are? Even stars that are extremely see, dim. So you and you can get a very good I estimate for the total. Let me see if there There's more. So I want to say there are lots of very good questions here. And we may not be able to get through all of them. But uh, we will have a little reception immediately after the Q&A. So hang out. And maybe you can ask the questions directly to uh, Dr. Baruki. So one of the questions is, how did Earth get its water? And is there reason to believe many exoplanets could expect the same good luck? That sounds like a question from a planetary scientist. <laughs> nope. Is that one of your students? Is that one of your students that did that? <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting question. How did Earth get its, its water? Obviously, there was a big collision. Earth, struck, a, a object hit the Earth, formed the moon, probably blew away the ocean, the atmosphere, and things like that. How did it get that water? Were they brought in by comets? comets? Some comets have a lot of water. Some asteroids have a lot of water. Or people say, no, 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 that, that's not true. When, you, when you're forming the planet, you're, talk, you're talking about wet rocks that form the planet. And you're squeezing the water out of the rocks. And it's coming up with the rocks. It's coming up with the volcanoes. Certainly volcanoes give off water. Now, some of that water is recirculated from the ocean. So nobody knows the answer to that. But boy, there are a lot of people getting their PhD thesis by writing about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I know one of them who worked for me, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> well, we also know that water is made of hydrogen and oxygen, both of which are very abundant in the universe. Yes. So we anticipate that a lot of these planets do have water. Yes. Um, here's an interesting question about the uh, genesis of the mission. When you first proposed it, did you expect this project to take as long as it did? No. I <laughs> You, you don't want to get into science, you don't want to get into things like this if you're not a Pollyanna. So you need to start out being a Pollyanna, okay? It's going to work. Everybody will recognize how wonderful this is and so on. And of course, when they turn it down, you've worked for 
a proposal for a spacecraft is around 200 or $250,000. You have to round up a lot of people and money to write a proposal. And when you're shot down, they say, oh, this is wrong with it, that's wrong with it, that's wrong with it. That's a pretty big downer, you know? It takes a while to recover from that and say, oh, those people don't know what they're talking about. This is a great <laughs> mission. Let's propose it again. <laughs> and so you were shot down four times? Five. Five times. <laughs> In 92, well, when we proposed, they wouldn't even give us money for a conceptual study, much less a spacecraft. Well, I want to thank you for your perseverance because Kepler, again, has really transformed <laughs> what we know. So, uh, a lot of papers have been published, including work done here at UCLA, based yes. on the Kepler data. So uh, yes. a former graduate student of mine at UCLA looked at the architecture of planetary systems and mm -hmm. was able to show that many of them are closely aligned. They're sort of, yes. the geometry is between that of crepes and pancakes. It's very flat, right? That the orbits of the and planets... And the work that you and your student have done is very clever because how do you figure this out? <laughs> Okay, you see a bunch of trances, but that doesn't mean that one of them cocked a little bit this way, the one's that way, and so on. And yet, you know, you've been able to figure out from those, that data that they really are flat. Yeah. So it's impressive. Right. It's really impressive to see what people do with the data we have, because all the data you have are these little dips. There isn't any more data. You have to figure it out from your theory and your ideas and your mathematics. So it's impressive to see students in particular who managed to do much more than most of us ever imagined could be done. Um, this question is about the Drake equation, which quantifies the number of uh, civilizations that might be communicating with us. And the question is, how has the Kepler data changed our knowledge of the Drake equation? Drake, of course, is a professor uh, emeritus at University of California in Santa Cruz. He uh, is part of the SETI program with Jill Tarter and others. The SETI program has a Drake Award, contribution to solving a Drake equation. I won that last year. <laughs> because if you look at the various terms, you, can, you have to calculate how many stars have planets, how many planets are habitable zone. But you still can't solve it. You have to know how many civilizations there are and how long the civilizations last. Those are the hard parts. So I think we were able to help a little bit, but there's a long ways to go for us to understand the implications of the Drake equation, which is basically trying to tell us about technical civilizations in our galaxy. It's a wonderful equation, a wonderful idea to sort of think quantitatively about things like that. I think you're being a little modest there. So before <laughs> Kepler, there were essentially terms for which we had no idea what the value was. And now we know, at least yes. for a couple of them, we know what the answer that, is. That's true. So it's a, a big advance. Um, here's a question maybe from a younger person in the audience. What advice would you give, you, would you give to an aspiring scientist? We know the, uh, you know, I, I hate to say things like this. Did you have but, you know, you need to study hard. <laughs> Did you want to You need to understand your math, and you need to study your, your, your sciences. You need to understand your, your, the, the, your English, your grammar, your things like that. Because it's not enough to be a, a scientist. You have to be able to explain this to others. You have to be able to write about it. So you just have to believe your teachers and do your darndest best to do well in all your studies. That's what makes a scientist. You can say, well, I want to become a, uh, an astronomer, but I'm going, to monitor, I'm going to major in biology. That worked. We have biologists as part of our group. You know, if you're a biologist, you can change to astronomy. If you're an astronomer, change to biologist. There's astrobiology there. The main thing is to learn science, your, your science tools really well. So whether you're in grade school or high school, the answer is the same. Study hard, do your homework, mm -hmm. listen to okay. the people who are trying to help you because they want you to succeed. So I know that's boring, but it's, it's true. <laughs> what percentage, Bill, of exoplanets are in the Goldilocks zone? And do you think this is a percentage that we can safely extrapolate out or is the data too incomplete? Uh, 
what we want is an answer that we really believe. We want an answer, so whether you're a mathematician, whatever scientist, and you look through our calculations with a microscope, check every aspect. That is the last part of the Kepler project. The Kepler project finishes in September. We are doing that calculation. And we're trying to take into account the fact that there are all sorts of stars, all sorts of planets, that we miss a lot of these things. We build models of, of planetary systems, put them into our data, and see if we can find them. And that tells us how often we're wrong. So I don't know the, the, the answer to that. But if somebody were to say uh, maybe 10% or something like that, our planets are roughly Earth-sized in a habitable zone of stars similar to the sun, I wouldn't argue with them. But that's okay, a we'll, we'll close on this question, and it is a big question. Uh, do you believe aliens exist? <laughs> <laughs> you know, scientists are specialists. They can tell you about something. I can tell you something about planets. But I can't tell you much about biology, and not much for archaeology either. So, if you want to ask, answer that question, you ought to talk to a specialist, an astrologer. <laughs> All right. <laughs>